Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. In ancient Israel, the sins of the people that were atoned for during the year were represented by the daily sacrifice that was taken into the holy place each day for 354 days in that year. Then, on the one day, atonement was made for those sins that had accumulated during that year. There were two calendars that the Israelites used. There was the 12-month civil calendar and the 7-month religious calendar. In Matthew 13, Christ's parable of the sower says that the sower's seed is the word of God. The seven-month growing season represents the history of the church and the harvest is the end of the world. The parable of the sower tells us plainly that both the forgiveness of sins and the judgment of the wicked take place in the time of the harvest, which is also called the day of the Lord. So we know that the day of the Lord also comes at the end of time. We dare not miss the significance of this because what Christ's parable is actually saying is the Old Testament rituals and ceremonies were the first half of a much greater whole. In everything that God does, He is consistent. Just as the Levites represented the transition from Judaism to Christianity, so likewise the harvest festivals of Sabbaths also represent a transition from symbol to reality. Is it any wonder that Satan would do everything he can to turn people's minds and hearts away from this truth? In the end, the devil has only one goal, and that is to destroy as many lives as he can. The prophecies of Daniel and Revelation are especially important because they address this very issue namely how satan will try and usurp god's plan the prophecy means to explain exactly what satan will try and do to stop the day of atonement the day of atonement lies at the center of a larger scenario that the prophets call the day of the lord which we will talk about extensively in part three of this series In our study of the holy place, we talked about the promise of the new covenant that is found in the most holy place. To repeat, Jeremiah 31 says, The Lord promises three things under the provision of the new covenant. First, the Lord says, He will write His law on the fleshy tables of our hearts. He will be our God, and we will be His people. Second, there will be no more teaching or preaching since everyone will know the Lord for himself. And third, God will forgive our iniquity and remember our sins no more. What we need at this point is a timeline that will show us where these three promises belong. Fortunately for us, Jesus tells his disciples what will be the signs of his coming and of the end of the world. As the Lord explained the fall of Jerusalem, his prophetic words reach down to those that will be living in the last days. He does this because both generations have the same issue in common. They both reject his last offer of mercy. Before we get into the prophecy of Matthew 24, we need to make something clear. In Genesis 2 verses 11 to 14, four rivers are said to come out of Eden. As God would have it, Everything that takes place in God's plan of salvation occurs within the limits of their boundary. The four rivers, Pisan, Gihon, Hittakel, and the Euphrates form a kind of ring that extends from Babylon in the northeast to Ethiopia in the southeast, and from Libya in the southwest to Turkey in the northwest. Of course the earth back then did not look like it does today. Nevertheless, the countries are more or less the same, 
as are the general direction that each river spans across. As we discuss the last days and the events that will occur on God's timeline, let us keep in mind that God has also set a geographic limit on His plan, which is very helpful in keeping us from speculating about times and places that are not really relevant to the prophecy. At number one, Jesus says, Beware of false teachers that will proliferate, no doubt because of the many wars and rumors of wars that will take place, especially in the Middle East. The Lord says, Times will be difficult, but the end is not yet. At number two, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in many places as nations shall rise against nation. This will be the beginning of sorrows, which, as John 16 21 tells us, will be the time of the Last Supper for God's church. At that time, the church will be prepared to receive the baptism of God's Spirit and follow Christ to Calvary. Now notice the sudden transition that takes place at number three. Something happens that takes us from the beginning of labor pains to the full-blown fires of persecution. That something is the birth of the child. The child in John 16 is the image of Christ reproduced in his church. So the gospel is being proclaimed just as Jesus said it would be and now the time of the end has come. In John 16, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow, because her hour is come, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish, but joy that a man is born into the world. And you now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man will be able to take away from you. We can't say enough about how significant the birth of the child is in John 16. Jesus is, of course, referring to his birth and what it means prophetically. If you'll notice, each time a child is born, that child's birth marks the beginning of the end for a nation of people. In this case, it was Christ's birth that marked the beginning of the end for Israel as a nation. Their rejection of him at birth was a sign of things to come. As Matthew 2 and verse 3 says, Herod was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. In John 16, the birth of the child marks the beginning of the end of their period of probation. Like Herod, Pharaoh tried to kill who he thought would be the promised deliverer of Israel. That scenario was prophetic of what would happen in Bethlehem under Herod. And as it happened, Pharaoh sealed his fate by finally bringing down upon Egypt the seven last plagues, which symbolized the close of probation for the whole world. And finally, Revelation refers to both Egypt and Bethlehem as a woman standing on the moon flees from the serpent that tries to kill her child as soon as it is ready to be delivered. Revelation uses the two historical scenarios of Egypt and Bethlehem to make the point that the beginning of the end has come for the last time. The false are separated from the true and the seven last plagues are about to fall for the last time. Clearly, the message of John 16 is, the birth of the child marks the beginning of the end. No matter the kingdom or its ruler, the birth of the child means the end of that ruler's reign is imminent and the close of probation is sure to follow not long after. The next sign that Jesus mentions in verse 15 is the abomination of desolation, which we've seen before. Remember, the Passover is the last sign that God gives as a warning to flee. This tells us the Last Supper is the experience of all those that receive the good news of the gospel as it is preached in all the world. Symbolically, it lasts for however long it takes to reach those that seek salvation during the last call to be saved. In Acts 3, Peter says, 
Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Peter makes it clear that a. Judgment begins at the house of God. We're told the first to be forgiven are those that proclaim the truth. He also says their forgiveness comes as the first sign of the latter rain that is given to the world, after which those that are converted are also forgiven and reconciled to God. The times of restoration is the third of the three promises fulfilled under the provision of the new covenant. Clearly then, as the final call to repentance is given by the church, all three of the new covenant's promises are met and fulfilled during the time of the Last Supper and the latter rain. All of this says the new covenant has everything to do with the final proclamation of the gospel and the end of the world. The three promises of Jeremiah 31 are in fact the prophecy of the revelation of Jesus Christ that will come in the last days. God's last day church will be qualified for the task at hand. They will be blameless before God as they represent Him before the nations. God's last message of salvation will be the final revelation of Jesus Christ as God has given it to His Son Jesus Christ to give to His servants in the church. This is the meaning and the significance of the P that stands for purification. The purification that God promised when He first spoke to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden after their fall in the promise of Genesis 3.15. What we've been saying since the very beginning is that the revelation of Jesus Christ is an ongoing affair. The light of truth that shines down on the path of righteousness has been steadily increasing over time. When the tabernacle was finally finished, the pillar of cloud came down and filled the whole temple with the glory of God so that Moses and the children of Israel could not look upon it. This was God's promise that he would fill the whole earth with his glory. He would, in the end, save his people from their sins. The light of the gospel will go forth into all the world, and the end will come. God has declared it, and it will surely come to pass. In the next presentation, we will look at exactly how the timeline of the Most Holy Place will be fulfilled as we consider the prophecy of the Day of the Lord.